It's about sex. It's about death. It's about the elite, the Illuminati. It's about jealousy. Hi, I'm Filippo Olivieri. Welcome back to Cracking the Cube. This episode is about eyes wide shut, or to be more precise, about the 40 year long interest, if not obsession, that Kubrick had for Tram Novella, a novelette by Viennese playwright Arthur Schnitzler. As if we were conducting a psychoanalysis session, we will go back in time to bring to the surface what lies beneath Kubrick's laborious work on Eyes Wide Shut. This talk will try to answer a simple question, which in truth is not simple at all. Why was Kubrick so attached to Arthur Schnitzler's Tram Novella, the literary source of Eyes Wide Shut? When the film opened in 1999, it polarized the opinions of critics and audiences, but even those who didn't particularly like it nonetheless considered that it gave the impression of being a very personal film from Kubrick, or even his most personal. The same opinion was held by members of Kubrick's family. But what does it mean exactly? Is Eyes Wide Shut more personal in the sense that it is a much cherished project? A film in which Kubrick put his heart and soul, as his daughter Anya seems to suggest with that quote? Or is it personal because it is more revealing, as if it were an autobiographical film in disguise? Some anecdotes from the production brought about this idea. For example, Kubrick's wife Christiana once revealed that the Harford's apartment in the film is a replica of the Central Park West property in which the Kubricks lived in the early 60s. Or perhaps, as one critic wrote, the film is Kubrick's most personal simply because it deals with the most personal of subjects, sex. The thing is, it's easy, obvious even, to say that an intimate marital story must draw from an artist's personal background, but in fact there is hardly anything original in Kubrick's selection of subject matter, which has been treated widely in all arts throughout human history. Adultery, in particular, is one of the most common themes of Western fiction. At the same time, though, I do see something special in Kubrick's selection of Tram Novella as material for a film, because this particular story occupied Kubrick's imagination for the longest time, developing an obsessional quality that was unprecedented even by Kubrick's standards. This is not a place to chronicle the laborious process behind the making of Eyes Wide Shut in full, but it is necessary to at least point out two things. The first is how Kubrick turned his attention to Tram Novella every time he had finished with a film. In fact, Eyes Wide Shut can itself be regarded as a return to Schnitzler after the failures of the three main projects which were under development in the early 90s, All the King's Men, AI and Aryan Papers. A decade earlier, with Full Metal Jacket almost finished, Kubrick immediately went back to Tram Novella and sought the advice of a Clockwork Orange author, Anthony Burgess, with regard to the story's conclusion. During and after the making of The Shining, Kubrick spoke about Tram Novella to Diane Johnson and Michael Herr, discussed it with John Le Carré, asked his assistant Tony Fruin to draft a scene, and had Terry Southern send a few tentative dialogue sequences for a comic adaptation. Following the release of Barry Lyndon, Kubrick asked Gabby Blau, his lawyer's daughter, to write a concept for the story. He then sent the novella to Anthony Burgess and started a written conversation with him about it. After A Clockwork Orange, he committed to the project for the first time, with an announcement from Warner Brothers. And a month after the release of 2001 A Space Odyssey, Kubrick first inquired about buying the rights to the story. Although this constant recurrence is shared by many other unrealized projects, Tram Novella is indeed special in the sense that it is the longest-running, constantly active project in Kubrick's career. In actuality, Kubrick's attraction to it predates 1968. Even if we still do not know when exactly he first read Tram Novella, we do know that the book was amongst his belongings in 1963, and that apparently he was made aware of it in 1959, when Kirk Douglas's psychiatrist suggested Kubrick to read it. In any case, Kubrick's interest in Austrian literature, and specifically in Schnitzler around the late 50s, is confirmed by three facts. In 1959, Kubrick wrote to cartoonist Jules Pfeiffer and asked him to develop a modern love story in the mood of Schnitzler's works. 
He also met with Schnitzler's nephew during the filming of Spartacus. And Kubrick's then-producing partner, James B. Harris, told me that they considered adapting another story by Schnitzler, The Death of a Bachelor, around the same time they developed an adaptation of Stephen Zweig's The Burning Secret. In my study of Kubrick's unmade films, I found out another intriguing thing. In addition to The Death of a Bachelor and The Burning Secret, several other projects that Kubrick tried to realize deal with love, marriage and sexual relationships. But once Kubrick decided on Tram Novella, he stopped considering alternatives. Tram Novella apparently was, for him, the best story to explore everything that goes between men and women, or at least his favorite. In fact, Tram Novella must have been so crucial to Kubrick's understanding of male-female dynamics that he used it as a blueprint during the scriptwriting phase in other projects. For example, a certain Schnitzlerian air was breathed into the Napoleon script when Kubrick had Napoleon watch an orgy from a distance without feeling brave enough to participate, just like Fridolin, the main character in Tram Novella, does. And again, an orgy inspired by the novelette was included in an early draft of The Shining screenplay, where the marital relationship between Jack and Wendy Torrance is also modelled on the married couple in Tram Novella. It appears that an adaptation of this Schnitzler story was not only constantly on the verge of happening, but also so fundamental that it bled over the projects which took priority. It does seem that there is indeed something special about Tram Novella, and hence about Eyes Wide Shut. But what is it? And why was Kubrick so fond of it? It is not easy to answer. In fact, virtually all the writers that Kubrick approached for the adaptation wondered why too, not really liking Tram Novella themselves. Frederick Raphael, for example, said that he was kinda maddening, good but not that good, and dated. Sarah Maitland told Kubrick she found it seriously boring. Diane Johnson expressed a similar opinion. The story didn't grab her, she told me. She thought it was clumsily Freudian. And when she spoke about it with Michael Herr, they both did not get it, wondering what the appeal of this story was for Kubrick. The exception is Candia McWilliam, who understood the potential of Tram Novella immediately. Uh, of course, because it was all about the unknowability of those we love. The story at that point was very clearly about the mutual manipulation of jealousy, which is torture. It's what we can do to one another in the most intimately painful way. Who hasn't felt a atrocious jealousy and atrocious remorse? And who hasn't in the end felt that fidelity is absolutely crucial? especially after it's too late and one's broken it. And it's heartbreaking. When I spoke to her, McWilliam admitted that she too felt that there was something special about this project. A very great deal about that film was personal, and I never wanted to be so impertinent as to ask why. A clue to understanding why Tram Novella resonated so much with Kubrick comes from the press release of the film. It's a single sentence and the only thing that Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman were allowed to say before the film opened. Eyes Wet Shut is a story of jealousy and sexual obsession. Following McWilliams' insight, the key word here is jealousy. Tram Novella finally gave Kubrick the chance to make his jealousy movie. Kubrick's interest in such a movie is revealed by film director Albert Brooks, who received an out-of-the-blue call from Kubrick after his film Modern Romance was released. Kubrick wanted to know how Brooks managed to make such a movie and said that he always wanted to make a film about jealousy. Modern Romance is a wordy neurotic comedy of self-deprecating humor, and it obviously alerted Kubrick in a period when he was considering a comedic adaptation of Tram Novella. Brooks' film touches on jealousy and sexual obsession, and it features several moments that chimes with bits of eyes wide shut, such as the protagonist's inner monologue inside a car, or the fact that he always sees couple in love when he wanders around the city at night. Albert Brooks was not the only fellow director that Kubrick kept his eye on. Eyes Wide Shut is actually filled with references to several filmmakers who beat Kubrick at solving the jealousy movie problem. 
A blatant example is Love in the Afternoon by Eric Romer, a film that tells the same story as Eyes Wide Shut. A man is tempted by infidelity but in the end returns to his wife. Kubrick draws several scenes from it. The most interesting to me is the film's ending, in which the wife asks her husband to make love to her as a way to fix their problems. It could be worth mentioning that the couples in both films are played by actors married to each other in real life. Several films referenced in Eyes Wide Shut were directed by people whom Kubrick knew personally. It has been noted before that two lines of dialogue in Eyes Wide Shut are seemingly lifted from James Cameron's True Lies. Archival documents reveal that Kubrick watched the film with Cameron at his house while he was preparing Eyes Wide Shut and kept a copy of the screenplay in his office. The two lines of dialogue were added during rehearsals, so I would take the quote as intentional. After all, what is true lies if not the James Cameron take on the jealousy movie? Another scene that Kubrick changed to wink at one of his director friends is Alice's phone call to Bill. Initially, the scene was set in the bedroom, but then Kubrick decided to reshoot it nine months later to move it to the kitchen where a TV set is playing Paul Mazursky's Blooming Love. The film's promotional tagline, a love story for guys who cheat on their wives, makes it a particularly clever choice for the scene, considering that cheating on his wife is exactly what Bill is about to do on the other hand of the line. Another variation on the on-again, off-again type of relationship, Blooming Love is ultimately, as eyes wide shut, a statement on true love, something that, according to what both Mazursky and Kubrick seem to say with their respective films, can only be achieved within the boundaries of marriage. Paul Mazursky was not a random filmmaker that Kubrick picked. He was one of Kubrick's closest friends during his Greenwich Village years and featured in Fear and Desire. Indeed, another film by Mazursky proved to be an even more direct source for Eyes Wide Shut. Next stop, Greenwich Village is an autobiographical work in which Mazursky gave dramatic form to his experiences as an aspiring actor in the 50s. Essential to the plot is the protagonist's love story with a girl and her betrayal with one of his friends. There are a few visual connections between the two films, but what strikes me in particular is this moment in which the couple tries to reconcile after her confession. Documents in the archive again prove that Kubrick rearranged the blocking of the scene to have Cruz and Kidman imitate the couple in Mazursky's film. In an earlier configuration, they were holding their hands on opposite sides of the bed. The visual allusion is again particularly fitting, given that it connects two couples dealing with betrayal and trying to make peace. Naturally, Kubik's best friend and former business partner James Harris is included too with Some Call It Loving, a film that Harris wrote, directed and produced in 1973 by adapting a short story by John Collier. A personal theme to Harris, as Eyes Wide Shut is to Kubrick, Some Call It Loving is an exploration of sexual fantasies and erotic role-playing. It tells the story of a guy who awakens a sleeping beauty but cannot find happiness nonetheless. Kubrick quoted Some Call It Loving in the Sonata Café scene of Eyes Wide Shut. The staging, blocking and camera movements are all identical to the jazz club scene in Harris' film. And the closing line again was lifted and reworked in the Christmas party scene at the beginning of Eyes Wide Shut during rehearsals. One could also argue that the warm glowing effect of the cinematography by Mario Tosi served as an inspiration for Kubrick and his lighting cameraman Larry Smith, or that the dream castle in which the story unfolds was taken as a model for an equally oniric location in Eyes Wide Shut. Even some of the costume choices seem to have been borrowed from Harris's film. We'll talk more about Sam Collit Loving in a moment. For now, I think it's clear that Tram Novella was the story that gave Kubrick the chance to finally make his own jealousy movie. And jealousy is therefore the subject of Eyes Wide Shut. But the topic of jealousy is an undercurrent that reoccurs throughout Kubrick's career, and of which Bill Harford is only the most evident manifestation. In Barry Lyndon, Redmond Barry is jealous of his cousin Nora when she flirts with Captain Quinn, and later Lady Lyndon is jealous of Barry who betrays her several times. 
In Lolita, Charlotte Hayes is jealous of Humbert Humbert, who is in turn madly jealous of Lolita. The same happens to George Patty, who is jealous of his wife Sherry in The Killing. And finally, in Killer's Kiss, Vincent Rapallo is the most jealous character in Kubrick's filmography. The closer we get to the early projects, the more jealousy becomes prominent and connected with marital infidelity. Adultery is central to the plot of The Burning Secret and even more to that of The Death of a Bachelor, which is essentially a psychological study of how three husbands react to the news that all their wives cheated on them with the same man. Moreover, a number of plot and character sketches that Kubrick jotted down when he was young deal precisely with this functional marriage, jealousy and adultery. For example, a treatment titled Jealousy tells the story of a wealthy New York business manager who suspects his wife is having an affair. With a growing sense of paranoia, he begins to have visions of his wife's infidelity and decides to take revenge by sleeping with a stranger, something he ultimately cannot bring himself to do. Another archived folder, titled The Perfect Marriage, contains a document with a series of philosophical reflections on the marriage story, as Kubrick termed it, which is inevitably connected to cheating and shows clear links to Schnitzler's insights into the psychology of men and women. It is revealing that various recurring narrative and visual motifs in these writings, such as a wife's confession, sexy dreams, haunting fantasies of betrayal, etc., are closely reminiscent of Schnitzler's own plot devices and imagery. An incomplete screenplay titled The Married Man helps us bring into focus another aspect of jealousy. An excerpt shows it as something that the husband would like his wife to feel about him. Marriage is like drowning in a sea of feathers, Kubrick wrote, sinking deeper and deeper into the soft, suffocating depths of habit and familiarity. If she'd only fight back, get mad or jealous even just once. Fifty years later, Kubrick would have this very feeling uttered by a woman character. And why haven't you ever been jealous about me? Why was Kubrick so taken by stories about jealousy and betrayal? Or to put it differently, how personal is indeed the story told in Eyes Wide Shut? Many have already speculated on the topic, but I want to take a different approach. As I always do in my studies, I try to get to primary sources. In this case, I interviewed the composer Gerald Fried, who was one of Kubrick's closest friends during his formative years in the Greenwich Village and knows a lot about Kubrick's view on romantic relationships. I have a memory of him being amazed and even appalled at the infidelities of the people we knew around us and the fact that so many people, for sexual advantage, would make up lies and stories, Uh, and I think he was appalled uh, and fascinated by the lengths people would go to, perhaps especially men, to achieve some sexual advantage at the risk of truth and, and honesty and even decency. I think that he was a little nervous about uh, the facility with which the people can betray one another or betray a marriage for the sake of a little uh, you know, biological uh, action or aggrandizement. I, I think um, th- there's no doubt about it, but that was uh, a preoccupation of Stanley. You know, how we could deal with people knowing that there are subcurrents that they won't speak about, but that are present in most people. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a little scary to know that people we see every day and trust and love are capable of this kind of uh, psychological bifurcation. This is precisely what Tom Cruise said during the promotional round of interviews for Eyes Wide Shut. Stanley had understood and was very clear on this. People often have a split personality just as they pass from darkness to light and vice versa permanently. Remember Candia McWilliams' words, the film she began to write for Kubrick had to be about the unknowability of those we love. It's as if Stanley was appalled by the concept of someone looking you right in the eye without blinking and lying about a sexual uh, affair. That, to him, was a horror story. 
and it troubled him deeply, infidelity. Like it could happen to him too. Which, in fact, it seems it did. In those years, Kubik was married to Ruth Sobotka, a very erudite Viennese-born ballerina who was part of the New York avant-garde. She contributed to Kubrick's education in many ways, and it was likely her who introduced him to Austrian literature. Fried told me that Kubrick received an anonymous letter claiming that Sobotka was being unfaithful while she was touring Europe with the New York City Ballet. Sobotka disputed the veracity of such letter, as did many of their mutual friends. Fried even tried to reconcile the two, but Kubrick didn't want to listen and ended the marriage. According to Fried, Kubrick had been very apprehensive about Sobotka touring the world, and the possibility of her betrayal had troubled him. I think Stanley find out all about infidelity and the, the difficulties and the requirements of marriage, and then when he understood that he too was subject to those kinds of feelings, I, he was very troubled and didn't like it. Several have commented on the role of Ruth Sobotka in the genesis of Eyes Wide Shut and on Kubrick's jealousy for her, quite often in wild and salacious ways. I only want to stress that in the same way that many scholars draw parallels between Arthur Schnitzler's unrestrained sexuality and his stories of jealousy and promiscuity, I think it is possible to read the events in Kubrick's life as a way to better understand his attachment to those stories. At the very least, it should be noted that by looking at the chronology of Kubrick's projects, it is evident how the stories about jealousy and marital strife cluster around 1956, which is the year in which Kubrick's marriage with Sobotka began to unravel. Whether for personal or artistic reasons, or perhaps for a combination of both, undoubtedly there is something about Schnitzler that captured Kubrick's imagination. Because Kubrick died before doing any interview for Eyes Wide Shut, quotes from him about Schnitzler are scarce. But given his sustained interest in Schnitzler's stories, he did talk occasionally about him in the years previously. For example, in 1960 he said it is difficult to find any writer who understood the human soul more truly and who had a more profound insight into the way people think, act and really are. Actually, the most revealing quote to understand Kubrick's take on Schnitzler is precisely one about Tram Novella that he gave in 1972. The theme of the story is that people have a desire for stability, security, habit and order in their lives, and at the same time they would like to escape, to seek adventures, to be destructive. This is precisely what he was trying to express in those three early scripts that we mentioned. All those main characters leave the unending conflict between stability and adventure. Some of them indulge in numerous affairs while dreaming of a more stable future, while others feel trapped in a monogamous family life and seek thrills outside their relationship. Given that this duality seems very important for Kubrick, I asked Jerry Fried about it. Among those within the Greenwich Village circle, the person who most lingered in the adventure part of the equation was Howard Sackler, the co-writer of Fear and Desire and Killer's Kiss. According to Fried, Sackler seemed only concerned with getting kicks out of life, even at the expense of friends. As a matter of fact, the fictional betrayer in Next Stop Greenwich Village was inspired by what happened to Mazursky in real life, when his then-girlfriend cuckolded him with Sackler. In the film, a fictional version of Sackler is played by Christopher Walken. I, I, I think there was an element, maybe in me as well as in Stanley, of kind of admiration that Howard Sackler would lead this kind of life and and take pleasure in destroying marriages uh, to show his masculine power. And I remember we were talking about it, and uh, I got the feeling that the, it was not 100% disapproval of Howard Sackler's behavior. It was disgusting, and we felt like punching him out, but uh, there may have been an element of, my gosh, this fellow has a power that we don't have. There is an anecdote on record that supports Jerry's memory. 
According to Mazursky, Kubrick too tried to make a pass at Mazursky's soon-to-be wife when he was married to Toba Metz, his first wife. Anya Kubrick, when she said that Eyes Wide Shut reflects the moral philosophy of her father, added that the central idea of the film is that we are all both good and evil, and if you think you have no evil in you, you're not looking hard enough. With Eyes Wide Shut, Kubrick was exploring the male psyche with the honesty and knowledge of someone who does not consider himself exempt from the issue he is analyzing. The desire for adventures chimes with other anecdotes from Kubrick's life, such as his admiration for Kirk Douglas's purported sexual competence and veracity during the shooting of Pass of Glory and Spartacus, when Douglas allegedly had an assistant who pimped women for him two or three times a day. Frederick Raphael wrote quite perceptively, like Schnitzler's hero, Kubrick was fascinated and appalled by things he witnessed but could not quite bring himself to do. These are all eminently Schnitzlerian situations, testing the friction between dreaming of a life filled with adventures and the inability to have the audacity to live them, between being repelled by the ruthless behavior of those who cheat on their partners and at the same time fascinated by that freedom and power. It really is of no surprise that Schnitzler's stories struck a powerful chord in Kubrick. In a sense, it is not even important to discuss why he selected Tram Novella. We could say it encapsulates the themes better than other stories, or that it has a dreamlike quality that surely appealed to Kubrick. But that would be, as he once said, a bit like trying to explain why you fell in love with your wife. She is intelligent, has brown eyes, a good figure. Have you really said anything? Tram Novella had something that appealed to Kubrick, very much so that it was the story he wanted to live the rest of his life with. But if we want to try and guess the reason behind the selection of Tram Novella anyway, I'd suggest we take another look at some Colit Loving, specifically at this scene midway into the movie in which the awakened girl tells about what happens during her sleep. I don't remember when I fell asleep but it couldn't have been too long after when I had a dream. It was more like a nightmare. A man, someone I'd never seen before, was kissing me. I don't know how he got there or anything, but he, he was kissing me and I couldn't seem to do anything to stop him. Then he would stop and go away. And there'd be nothing. For a long time, there'd be nothing. Then it would start again. Only in this dream, lots of strange men would kiss me and touch me, and I couldn't stop them. The resemblance to Alice Sanford's monologue about her dream is striking. He was kissing me. And then... Then we were making love. And there were all these other people around us, hundreds of them everywhere, and everyone was fucking. And then I... I was fucking other men. So many. I, I don't know how many I was with. Harris told me that he hadn't read Tram Novella, so he couldn't have drawn from Schnitzler to write this monologue. And yet, in adapting Collier's story Sleeping Beauty, Harris deliberately discarded everything but the core idea, so that, in his hands, the story no longer is a satirical take on the romantic view of love as Collier's intended, but a study about the impossibility of reconciling sexual dreams with real life. In particular, Harris added a dream element to the film that is completely absent in the original story, while it is central in Austrian literature. In Harris's hands, Sleeping Beauty became a Schnitzlerian type of story. Given how close Harris and Kubrick were, both professionally and personally, this outcome is not that surprising. They both must have seen sex, love and relationships through the lens of Austrian intellectuals. 
Schnitzler, Zweig and Freud educated them both on the inner workings of our psyche, on our fantasies and fears. In fact, let's consider another rare quote by Kubrick on Tram Novella. He said that the novelette tries to equate the importance of sexual dreams and might-have-beens with reality. The same can be said about Harris's film. In this regard, Eyes Wide Shut and Some Call It Loving are sibling works. They are sibling works for another reason, I think. James Harris gave shape to his own tendencies and fears in Some Call It Loving. The film was a way to acknowledge his inability to have a solid, faithful relationship because he indulged in his sexual fantasies. If you have multiple relationships in your life, Harris said once, if you keep moving on from one girl to another, as I had, could there be something wrong with all the girls? It had to be something within myself that was causing these abortive relationships. Even though Some Call It Loving is not an autobiographical film, the film's hero can be seen as an oblique persona for Harris. Equally, it would be too much of a stretch to identify Bill Harford as an alter ego for Kubrick. Nonetheless, Eyes Wide Shut is the film in which Kubrick expressed his own personal views of love and marriage. If Harris let the hunger for adventures lose, his protagonist's story ends without any reconciliation, Kubrick focused on the stability side of the equation. Bill returns to his wife and they both want their marriage to work. Among all the stories by Schnitzler, Tram Novella is one about a marriage that holds, despite internal and external forces. Fridolin and Bill Harford in Eyes Wide Shut is a character caught between dreams and reality who lingers amid the opposite forces of order and disorder until he ultimately chooses to get back to his wife, remain faithful to her and restore stability, habit, security. The hero in Harris's film is equally caught between dreams and reality, but in contrast to Kubrick's hero, chooses to wake up the girl and forever indulge in his fantasies. The choice of source material and how they were adapted on the screen reflect Harris and Kubrick's respective personalities and life experiences. Marital infidelity was a deeply felt subject for Kubrick, one that he tried to bring to the screen throughout his entire life. The fear of what might lie beneath the surface of marriage is yet another taboo subject that he explored in his films, each tackling an unspeakable suppressed issue. The Jungian shadow and the excitement of war in Full Metal Jacket, the vanity and ephemeral nature of all human deeds in Barry Lyndon, the horror that lurks in the family, and so on. As with any artist, what he observed and experienced during his youth forged his sensibility. The same holds true for Mazursky and Harris, and the other artists we refer to, who made personal films. When Kubrick encountered Arthur Schnitzler and his stories of inner conflict, he immediately acknowledges Caliber. Perhaps he even recognized himself in those stories. As Diane Johnson said to me, Definitely, I think that Friedland spoke to Stanley in a powerful way, mm-hmm. so in a way that caused Stanley to stick with him for all those decades. Yeah. Screenwriter Jay Cox, who helped Kubrick buy the rights to Tram Novella in 1968, was perhaps the most perceptive of all. I think he found a soulmate there in Schnitzler's approach. An expanded version of this presentation will soon be published in an edited collection titled Eyes Wide Shut Behind Stanley Kubrick's Masterpiece. I wrote more about Ruth Sobotka and included bits from my interviews with Frederick Raphael and John Le Carré. Many thanks for watching this video. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. Please subscribe to my channel and see you at the next episode of Cracking the Cube. Ciao!